It is a great pleasure to welcome the singer for the Rolling Stones, Michael Philip Jagger. Mick, hey. how are you? Very well, thank you. Nice to be here. Nice to see you again. Uh -huh. uh, this album, there are so many legendary Stones albums, each with their own very colorful story. Why focus so intensely on the, albeit colorful, story of Exile, but that particular album in itself? Um, well, I guess it's got, you know, it ha it's quite often said to be people, you know, Stones fans, people, favorite record with the Rolling Stones. You know, they, people seem to like it, they still like it, they say it still holds up, it's interesting. And um, so when we were thinking about doing re any reissues, and that this is the one that the record company said, well, we would like to to do this first to see if this, you know, you can do something with reissuing this because, you know, we think it's the best one, it's the one that people request most. So, so I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine with me. I mean, it has the most songs on it. <laughs> you know, why is it your best album? <laughs> yeah, the most songs. Um, and I, you know, I didn't think that it, there would be an awful lot left of songs that were unreleased, to be honest, to be, you know, going to that part of it. But um, I was kind of a bit sceptical about that, to be honest. But, you know, there was, there was things there. Well, you said you've been living with this album for six months. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what have you discovered as you've, you know, is it difficult to go back to that time and, and dive into that chapter of your life? Well, not really, no. It's just, uh, it's pretty documented, a lot of, you know, photographs and that. And I mean, I was working a lot on, there's a documentary film we saw last night called Stones in Exile. Um, and, you know, I've been working on that a lot, you know, that's very time consuming. And, and as well as looking for these sort of outtakes and extra tracks. So I kind of, you know, once you once I start on something, you know, I got like jump into it. So I had to jump in to see what was going on and was that really then? And you know, was your memory playing tricks on you? Who thinks it does? You know, and then what? You know, what are facts? And when was when was that recorded? And when when was that done? And where were, what were you? And what else was going on? And what other songs were around at the time? You know, who else was playing music? And you know, and what other great records were out? And so all this kind of thing puts you in the time frame. Um, so, you know, I, I had quite fun doing that and, you know, did feel for a moment I was re relieving 1970, early 70s a bit much. But, you know, I kind of, I was, I, I was quite pleased with the two projects that I was involved with, which was the record and the, and the documentary. Well, tell us about how this will be uh, re-released, because there, because there are three packages, correct? Mm -hmm. Tell us about each one, if you If can. I can remember, if I know, I mean, um, there's the there's the Exile album as it was originally kind of released, but set on CD. You know, it's very just as it was with eighteen with uh, eighteen tracks, and then um, then there's a slightly more deluxe one with the uh, with the um, extra tracks, with, of which there I think there are ten. Right. Um, five or six have never really been heard before, and others are alternate takes of the of songs already on there, like Loving Cup and so on. Tumbler Days. Yeah, Tumbler Days. And um, then there's a deluxe, deluxe, very expensive, but definitely worth it. <laughs> um, big book, you know, package with with the vinyl and, and CDs, I think. And, and there's some film in, in, I can't remember whether, there's some extracts from the documentary in some of these packages, but I can't quite remember what. Cool. Uh, is it true that when you guys went to France, the band, for all intents and purposes, was not only broke, but quite in debt? I think so. I think we were in debt. Um, I mean, we did have some money. I mean, it's, it's like, I love it in the films. It's like, so in debt, we're living in this incredible house. <laughs> like, there's Keith on a speedboat, you know? I yeah. a speedboat. I hate it. Yeah. So I thought they just said they were broke. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, we did get advances from Atlantic, you know, to, to carry us through. And Atlantic advanced on the, on the album. I think that's how we funded it. And, um, but we had a lot of debt to pay back to the tax uh, people in the UK, which is why we had to leave the UK, because we couldn't earn enough to pay the tax. Something like so 93%, wasn't it? It was very, very high. You know, it was a socialist government, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the taxes went up to, yeah, over 90%. If you, you know, you know so if you earn 100, you had to pay, you know, 93, basically. So, it, that was going to make it very difficult to pay back taxes, so we, we, we left and... So we we're in a lower tax rate, so we could pay them back. Somerset Maugham, the English playwright, novelist, and short story writer, described the French Riviera as, quote, a sunny place 
for shady people. That's what he said. <laughs> we should know he lived there. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah, it's just very, you know, I'm going there on Friday because I'm going to the Cannes Film Festival and we have our documentary in the director's fortnight showing, which is kind of nice for the director and me, of course. Um, and yeah, no, it's got a work of, yeah, like all these places, it's like, you know, like Los Angeles, you know, on the surface, it's a, uh, but then you, you know, I love reading about all those, you know, those genres of novels, you know, set in the 40s and the corrupt police department. And the, so that's the South of France is, is not dissimilar to Los Angeles or the West Coast in some of these ways, you know, it's a developed strip of beach, you know, um, full of rich people and people that are trying to hide. Some of the songs, uh, I think maybe seven or eight, actually trace back or have their origins back as far as Let It Bleed, don't they? Some on Sticky Fingers, yes. uh, Sweet Virginia, I think, uh, maybe Shine a Light, Sweet Black Angel. Some of those yeah. have some... Oh, they're all recorded in England. So, so the, Starting at Olympic, or was yeah. that at your place in the country? Both, you know, Olympic and My House in the Country, um, that, that some of these tracks were recorded, um, and then, I don't know how many, but you said it's like seven or eight, or... Maybe even more, and then Murph, that then you know some of them were played there, and you know like we we, we were mentioning um, Tumbling Dice, that was done in London first, I think, you know, and then it had another name, and that you know then it it it, it became um, uh, Tumbling Dice later on in when we did it in France. So that you know there were some things that were already more or less done. And that's why I think it became a double album because we had, you know, one album's worth from France and we had the another album's worth of stuff we done in England. It was called the original working title was called Tropical Disease, right? I, if you say so. I've read, <laughs> I, 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 I've read I, I don't think that's really true. I don't, who cares? But I don't know. I think that was something else. I had a song called Tropical Disease, but uh, I never finished it, but but I don't think it was. It may have been, though. Who it's knows? that memory thing again. Who knows? I'm not arguing with it. <laughs> in 1995, you said about living in the south of France at that time, you said it was communal. It was a communal thing where you don't know if you're recording or living or having dinner. You don't know when you're going to play, when you're going to sing. In short, very difficult. <laughs> yeah, we'd, we'd sit, we'd, we'd, um, we had had some experience because we did a lot of recordings in my house in, in England. Um, with the same mobile truck, right. and we recorded, for instance, we recorded Bitch in, the, in in this way. We recorded Moonlight Mile. So that goes back quite a long way. Um, so we'd done this before, you know. I mean, it, it, it was it was in a, in a lot of ways easier in my house because because it, it was not in a basement and it was a much bigger room. And then when we got to this rented house that Keith rented, it, the, there wasn't a very big room you know so that you will slightly suffer with sometimes with the drum sound in the in a small room you have to find well, there were several rooms there were several yeah. rooms um which is fine but there wasn't a big room for the you know with a high ceiling for it. and it's easier to get a drum sound with a nice high ceiling i read one thing where the the horn players said one tried to take laying on their backs i don't know again if that's true i think they were asleep <laughs> <laughs> that was when they were laying on their backs. They were not laying on their backs playing. I'd like to talk about one of the newly uncovered songs, which is just great, and it's getting a lot of radio play. Plundered my soul. Tell yeah. us about that. I think I think that was recorded in France, and and there was no vo when I found that track in the archive, there was no vocal on it. There was no melody. There was nothing. Uh, there was, but the track was more or less as it is. I didn't have to edit it or anything. I just that was, you know, the arrangement was all very done guitar parts all done. Mick Taylor wasn't on it, nor was I. So um, I wrote some, I wrote the top line and wrote the lyrics and did it. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, Mick Taylor's not on this. Um, and Keith's just playing rhythm guitar. There's no lead guitar at all. So I got Mick Taylor to come and play in the little studio in London and put him on it. And it was just, you know, perfectly started in 40 years later. Was he surprised to hear from you? I think so. <laughs> I, think, I think he was very surprised. Was like playing something on Exile. Uh, it was released on Record Store Day uh, in yeah. a seven inch vinyl, which yeah. is very cool, and the B-side was all down the line. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you collect vinyl at all? Uh, not really. <laughs> I wouldn't think of you I as a vinyl a, I, I mean, think. I got some brilliant vinyl records, and I do have a turntable uh, in France, which my children um, like to get going as a great novelty. Um, <laughs> look, it goes round! <laughs> and I, and it sort of, I don't really, I must say, I'm a kind of, 
I'm not really much of an audiophile, and and as I travel so much, I just find it easy to just keep keep things on files, you know. I mean, I do have some CDs and stuff, but I don't really keep them. Either. If you get an idea for a riff, would you? Keith used to carry around a little mini recorder. Do you, can you? Are you capable of maintaining a riff in your head? No, no, no that's absolutely no. I don't believe anyone can. Uh, well, except for one or two, you know. Mistaken geniuses, they can remember things, and, and no, you can't remember. But you, you don't remember, so I always carry one. You know, I always, well, I haven't got one in my pocket now, but I've got you. But I, don't, yeah. but but I, but, but I always carry a little, you know, one with a little card, you know, and then right. I download it to my computer, and then then I can like. Give them titles and stuff. Okay. Another new song, new old song, is following the river, and that is all new vocals, is it not? Yeah, all of those, all of, a lot of these are. They're playing to my soul's all new vocals. Okay. Um, yeah, following my river was exactly the same as playing to my soul. It didn't have any vocals or, or any melody or any indication of a melody. Um, um, you know, the piano plays a melody, so I I sort of went off that. Nicky Hopkins plays the piano, and um, so I went off that and. I, that was a really hard one to do. I think ballads are more difficult because you're so aware of the, but you know you can't just shout out the odd thing here and there like in a rock song, and get away with it. Um, so you know, got to be really on. But that I I didn't think that was going to work. But I was really worried I was going to get nothing. But you just keep going, you know, you chip away at it, and then and eventually an idea will come. And I thought well, suddenly I got this top line. I thought this all works, and now what is it about, you know? But it, it eventually it came so. You know, I'm quite, I was quite pleased with the result of that, because I thought I was going to get nothing. We spoke with Don Was, and he mentioned something rather surprising to me. He said that there, uh, there is a stone's vault where these things are kept, but the actual masters for exile are no longer in existence. Is that your understanding of it as well? I didn't know that. Well, you told me that. <laughs> I'm sorry. So what is in existence then? Because I didn't, I didn't have them all transferred to files. I mean, I transferred some of them to all different kinds of platforms, but... Uh, I thought that we had, I mean, because there was a point in uh, that I did go through all the boxes and, and put them in all in some kind of order about eight years ago. Um, but I thought those boxes were there. Because we, because we knew which ones were recorded where, because the, the, the mobile track we had was a 16 track and the stuff, and Olympic only, at that time, still only had eight tracks. So we knew that was Olympic and that's how we knew. Because the... Truck, everything recorded on the truck was 16. Wow. Tumble and Dice, uh, it's mentioned in the movie Stones in Exile, and I had read about it before. The lyrics you actually got from speaking to the housekeeper at Nelcott that summer, is that No, it correct? wasn't that. It was the housekeeper in L.A. Oh, it was the housekeeper in L.A.? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The housekeeper in France would not have known any English terms. It all blurs <laughs> together a bit. But. No, 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 I said, and this, while I'm saying that in the movie, she's in the picture, and um, you can see her in the picture, and I, because I didn't really know a lot of these terms, and I said, do you play dice? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, can you just, like, tell me some of the words you use? And she told me some of the phrases, and I just use them in the song. <laughs> that is great. Have you been watching uh, Jimmy Fallon this week? The yeah, I've been show? Watching, yeah, I've been watching. What is your take on some of these wonderful young bands of today coming in and doing Stone songs? For example, Green Day on Monday night opened it with Rip This Joint. Yeah, they I were thought, really good. I thought they nailed it. They really nailed it. Um, and we, we, they came around, we had, um, they came over and partied the other night and after they'd done it and they told me how they'd done it. They're really hard. We've done it really hard. And I said, "Great, that's exactly what it needs," you know. Huh. But that they, but they was still recognisable. I thought they did it really well. And, and I thought, and I thought that um, Taj Mahal. Did you see Taj him Mahal Light? did do Shine a Light? I was going to say, yeah, Taj Mahal did Shine a Light. And um, I thought he did a great version. I saw him yesterday too, and he had a really good version of that. And um, Keith Urban did Keith Tumble and Dice. Keith Urban did a great version of Tumble and Dice. Very up tempo. I think perfect for the song, and uh, really rocking along there. We played a really nice solo. I thought on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any chance that because Friday they're going to show um, the movie on Jimmy Fallon, any chance the Stones might make a surprise appearance? No. No, I <laughs> think so. <laughs> because you had a little a cameo in one of the Jimmy Fallon shows where you... Uh, I think I intro the documentary on Friday Okay, with Jimmy. There is a, a little scene in um, a, uh, last night on the Jimmy Fallon show where you have a part in the show Lost, in which the is Lost. very funny. Yeah, it's very funny. <laughs> it was very funny to do. <laughs>
<laughs> it was really funny to do. Because, I mean, even Fish is going to be on there. And Fish, for their uh, Halloween show this year, did all of Exile on they Main did. Street. They did. That, and that's what gave me the idea when, when we were looking at artists for, for to invite on the Jimmy Fallon show. Right. That I thought that was a good uh, band to invite because I knew they'd done the whole thing. In fact, I listened to it when we were in L.A. We, we, we downloaded the whole concert and listened to it. Were you pleased? Yeah, I thought it was great. Huh. Really good. Um, Sweet Virginia has always been one of my favorites from Exile, and I heard originally it was done with everyone in a circle. Is that right? Which one, Sweet Virginia? Sweet Virginia. I think that was done, if my memory, I remember, I, that was done in an Olympic. Huh. Uh, I don't think it was everyone in. I think, but it was done live. I think you know the Bobby Keys played the sax solo live. We had, I think we overdubbed some vocals. It was all. It was pretty closely done though, because you can tell by the sound it's very warm and, um, you know, yeah, I think that was done in Olympic. From from country honk to Sweet Virginia, uh, maybe Dear Doctor, yeah. uh, Dead Flowers, yeah. Sweet Virginia. There's so many great songs that the Stones have done in a country style. Would you ever, in a set uh, where some bands might go to an acoustic portion, do a little mini country yeah, set? Yeah, be a good idea. We did. We, I think we have done a couple. You know, did two, three country songs in a row. When we were in, we were in Texas last. Um, we did. Um, Far away eyes. No, we did. Um, uh, that Bob Wills is still the king. Wow! You know that, you know that one? Yeah, that's yeah, we right. did that. Yeah, we did that one. Because um, you sort of, you sort of make, you know, do it tongue in cheek, but then I, I don't think you take yourself seriously, and yet it sounds great. Those songs uh, are fun. You know, well, I don't. I think I'm not sure you should take it all too seriously. <laughs> anyway, but uh, um, yeah, I do do it with a pinch of salt, and I just did an overdub on, on a Jerry Lee. Lou Jerry Lee Lewis version of uh, Dead Flowers. Wow. He's putting that on, and I just did. I was doing a, I was doing the harmony part, and he's doing a sort of reversal of what I normally do. So I did the harmony part. Yeah, and now, but I like doing that kind of music. And then, uh, and then when I was with Green Day the other night, I said, "Go and play the piano." So I played Far Away Eyes. I don't know if you know that one. I, I do. Oh my God, I love it. Solo album. And I, uh, I was like, "What am I going to play?" I'm playing the piano for. So I started to play Far Away Eyes. I didn't think they were expecting that one. On All Down the Line, there's a great studio when the band gets to L.A. And uh, Andy Johns, uh, your recording engineer, said to you, I don't quite hear this as a single. I'd like to hear it. You're doing a lot of mixes of it. I'd like to hear it on the radio. And you said, you want to hear it on the radio? And he said, yeah, but how can that happen? And you said, remember what you did? <laughs> yeah, I think because I think we'd done it before. And we just took it to the station and parked the car in the parking lot. <laughs> So go and play this. You gave it to Stu, Ian Stewart. Uh, yeah, I think. And he took it down to some radio station, yeah. and you and Keith and Andy hopped in the back of a limo, as the story goes, and you're riding up and down Sunset Boulevard listening. To I think a, I think we part. I think remember I just parked the car in the parking lot of the of the record of the radio station. Uh -huh. And, and then apparently reception. The story that yeah. I heard was that you you heard it once, and you got, you called Stu and said. Have them played again. <laughs> I don't remember anymore. Uh, but, yeah, it was a good way of testing. Uh, and maybe we wouldn't do that so much now, but you know, but that was pretty, you know, pretty cool way of hearing music in your car like that. Yeah, well, that's how most people hear it. Yeah. yeah. So it's We're pretty cool. Uh, uh, also in LA, Billy so Preston had said took you to some evangelical <laughs> services uh, to help you get a feel for some of the gospel. I used sounds. to go to those anyway. You know, I went. I used to go to. Um, Aretha's father's church. Wow. Um, Reverend C. L. Franklin. I used to go to his church. Um, I didn't used to go to Billy though, um, and I didn't go to. I never went to a church with Billy. Okay. But I used to go to those churches in LA and and, and other places too. And I used to go to those churches in Jamaica and and other places in the Caribbean where they're somewhat similar, not exactly the same, but they're, they're somewhat similar. Um, but you know, it was like gospel music, and um, a bit self-conscious sometimes in in the church. But you get used to it. You know, after about ten minutes, you just lose your inhibitions. Right. You know, carry on. Yeah. <laughs> Throw your hands in the air. You and, know, yeah. And, you know, people look at you at the beginning, but you know, like. I'd like to talk about the album artwork because I'm a great yeah. fan of album artwork. And yeah. uh, the gentleman, I think his name is Robert Frank, uh -huh. uh, that had a book uh, out that you and uh, Charlie found yeah. interesting called The Americans. Yes. And you approached him to do the album artwork, correct? Yeah, and we, we, we thought that his style of photography was very uh, fitted in you know, to the style of the album. It was very uh, gritty and so on, very American, if you will. And um, 
And uh, so we just called him up and he yeah, said that he'd love to do it. And and he made it really easy for us uh, because he, he a lot of this stuff he shot on 16mm. He didn't, he didn't, he had a, he had a, still cameras but he thought it would be best to ca capture this stuff and so we went downtown in LA and did it on 16mm and took the images off the 16mm and made a collage with some of his already existing pictures and so it was a, for us it was super easy to do. And the if you see the movie Stones in Exile you'll see those shots yeah. as they are on the album and where they originated from yeah. as you're walking down some of this. Is there a main street in LA called well, Main Street? I, am, but I, I seem to remember there is or was um, and it was very, very at that time until very recently. In fact, it was very, it was quite um, depressed that section of town, which is what Robert wanted, you know. What, and you see in the film, you see this kind of how how it really was. I think now it's all been rather done up, gentrified, and lots of high-rise buildings. But I think there is a main street, or was. My uh, favorite shot is a picture. I don't know where it was taken, but a picture of you and Keith. Uh, singing uh, at one microphone, and you have a bottle of old granddad. He has a, a can what of does beer. What you have? A bottle of beer in there, lightweight. Yeah, well, no, you had the granddad. He yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's just a great shot of the two of you singing together. Yeah, no, it's, we would do it on the same mic singing, you know, it doesn't always work, but we, there's, in that film, in the film we were talking about, uh, Stones in Exile, there's a shot of us record, uh, rehearsing Lumming Cup before we took it on the road and, and we're doing this on the same mic and the balance is really good. I mean sometimes you get a really good balance you don't have to rely on a calling engineer to get a balance for you. <laughs> Even though you don't like to print lyrics does it ever surprise I love printing lyrics. You don't. I do too. I always try it's other people that say we haven't got room for the lyrics. <laughs> uh, like, well, I always print the lyrics. Well, don't yeah. worry. Or the earlier ones you didn't yeah but does it ever surprise you how many mis misunderstood rolling oh yeah lyrics but every you know there's so many isn't there's those famous lists of yeah, famous there, songs that people there are books about it yeah there's books about there's it there's a book with the title funny. of excuse me while i kiss this guy yes, <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. and that's the title of the yeah. book regarding the yeah, yeah. hendrix there yeah exactly uh fast exactly. domino though i think he said isn't the lyrics aren't that important they are but n knowing them precisely is not that important. And on this record, your voices mix a little lower yeah, anyway. Some of them are low. You know, some of the more ballady ones is quite high. I mean, uh, when I was remastering it, I noticed that, you know, Shine a Light vocals are very high and you know, other ones are really not high enough in a bit of a mess. And, but, um, yeah, the, 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 the whole lyric thing. But then you kind of, for the lyric writer, some of the lyrics, you, know, you kind of like people to understand. You know, but the, the kind of rock things, you don't really mind too much about right. sometimes. Well, you mentioned Shine a Light. I just love that song. And uh, some people described it as your your blessing, your prayer, your wish to Keith. Uh, I don't know if you would interpret it that way well, or I not. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such but a... Whatever you want. <laughs> well, it can be whatever anyone interprets it's it. It's a but, very gospel song, isn't it? You know? But I, yeah, but I think... Is there anything you'd say about it? Um, well, I remember doing it. I did it in London with Billy Preston. That's what I remember doing. Uh, Playing and... Starting off playing the piano, I was playing the piano. But was playing the, um, but was playing the organ, and uh, Mick Taylor was playing the bass. I think we had a funny lineup where we were waiting for people to turn up, you know. And um, but uh, in the end, Billy played the piano and overdubbed the organ. But it's really a good. It uh, has a really interesting kind of dynamics to it, you know. So. so um, Charlie was a little it's got so many different dynamics in the song, and we never did this song on stage. And doing, you know, the, we never did it um, during the time of the '72 tour and all that. We never did this song. And in fact, we didn't do it till the '90s. And then it became kind of part of our repertoire. Is it? Is it towards Keith? Is it? Uh, no, not really. No, it's not towards Keith. All right, um, because your and Keith's relationship has been endlessly speculated on over the years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes as passive aggressive, sometimes as this love hate, sometimes as but ultimately you you've been together for so long. How how would you define the nature of your relationship? Well, you know, we were very uh, very old friends to to make it work. Like when we were very small children, and um, we know each other. Therefore, we know each other for a long time. And um, before we started playing music together, we knew each other quite well. So we go back a really long way, and you know. You, 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 over the years, your relationships with people 
you know, they change a lot, you know, you get, you know, first of all, you're just friends, and then you can't play together, then you're inseparable, then you want to be on your own, and then you get married, and then, you, you know what I mean, you, you, obviously you change a lot, and, but, you know, we've continued working together for a very, very long time, so, you know, there's always some good things that come out of all that over a long period, we, we you know, we've, we've written a lot of songs together, and, and um, done a lot of shows, and so, you know, I think we complement each other to a certain then. And today, are you tight? Would you say? Well, I don't see Keith as much as you know as I see the rest of the band because he lives in Connecticut, That's right. and I I don't live in the United States, so I don't, and he doesn't come to England as much as he used to. But you know, I look forward to seeing him when I can, and when we work together, we're together all the time. Will you uh, tour? Well, I'd like to. I'd like to tour, and you know, I'd like to get thinking about doing that real soon. There is a quality about this band that never ceases to amaze me, and I've been seeing you since Tour of the Americas. Uh, when uh, The quality that strikes me so profoundly is your ability to even take a 30-year-old song or, or older and make it sound like it just came off the presses today. It's so fresh, it's so alive, it's so vibrant, there's nothing held back. Would you comment on that? Yeah, I think you've got to, you've got to play your tunes, you know, with that. As if you first tour you playing them you know and if you can't then you should drop that tune you know to be honest because you've got a lot of other tunes so don't do that man. if you if you if you fail up with it and you can't hack it just drop it you know and do something else um and you know the the audience reacts you know that the audience is like react to your tunes and say you got to you just gotta you know if it, it's a kind of every time you play them, it's different, you know, because you're in a different place with a different audience, a different night, and you feel in a different way. Mm 